the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And again, welcome, friends, to worship today. If you want to take out your message notes, I would invite you to do so. We're in a series. Uh, for this Lenten season entitled, This Is Us. And we are looking at what it means to be a part of the family of God. Why do we do, as Christians, why do we do the things we do? What What do we believe about the things that we do? And today and into next week, we are going to examine worship. Why do we worship? What is this that we do here? Do we just come and is it all kind of accidental, just gathering here and whatever comes up, or is there actually a movement? Is there a focus and a plan? That's what we hope, I hope, we see either for the first time or, again, just to be reminded of the significance of this day. So with all that, let's pray together and ask God to speak to us. Heavenly Father, we do ask that through your word today, you would speak to our hearts, to our minds, to our souls. And Lord God, not just so that we will have more information, but that we will actually experience transformation. That you will change our hearts, change our minds a little bit or a lot, whatever you know that we need. So Lord, bless this time. Keep me out of the way, I pray as the preacher. And may your truth come forth in all of its purity. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Well, I'm often sent, as you can imagine, uh, sayings that come up on the web about churches, about Christianity, sometimes articles and those kind of things. And I, and I like them. I like to get the information. I like to see certain things. Uh, a lot of the times I will be, I will be given... Um, sometimes things that are should be on church signs and some of them are usually pretty funny but all of them have and strive and I'm I'm not a big fan of this but to sum up significant deep theological truths in just a few words which you know is really hard to do for example a family altar can alter a family Yeah, that's what I thought too. A lot of kneeling will keep you in good standing. Don't put a question mark where God put a full period. Don't wait for six strong men to take you to church. Exercise daily. Walk with the Lord. Give God what is right, not what's left. Give Satan an inch and he'll be a ruler. God loves everyone, but probably prefers fruits of the Spirit over religious nuts. 
God promises a safe landing, not a calm passage. He who, is in, who, he who is good at making excuses is seldom good for anything else. He who kneels, or she, who kneels before God can stand before anyone. Cute, trite, true, funny. But we know that the Christian life is, is much deeper. Sayings like this can remind us of key truths and keep our minds focused, and that's a good thing. Well, what about, it, what about following Jesus? Well, I'm going to kind of contradict myself what I've just said. In some ways, things are pretty simple, and I suggest to you that this core action that we all participate in on a Sunday morning, sometimes on a Sunday evening, sometimes during the week like we do at Lent, is worship. And worship is, in many ways, very simple. Because worship is something that we, all of us, each and every one of us, whether you're a believer in Jesus today or not, you were created to worship. All of us, the Bible says, were created in the image and likeness of God. Among other things, that means we were created for relationship. And the primary relationship for which we're, we were created is with God. And that relationship with God is characterized by our acknowledgement of who God is and what he has done. In the book of Deuteronomy, as God's people were readying themselves to be God's people, God's nation, after the Exodus, God gave the people of Israel many commands and many laws but they would all be summed up, and Jesus would do this, of course, much later, in the command to just simply love God. We see this among other places, Deuteronomy chapter 10. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Again, as you've heard me say many times, what God wants from you is you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to walk with you. He wants you to love him and fear him, not necessarily a fear of that something bad is going to happen or God is going to hurt me, but a fear of reverence, a fear of respect. That's the heart of fear the Lord your God. Now, I would suggest to you that if God were to show up here supernaturally before our eyes, one of the first emotions we would feel is fear. Fear, fear. Because fear is that human emotion that reminds us that we are actually out of control and can't control everything. But what God wants, let me just say it again, is a, a reverential awe that knows that this God, as revealed in the Bible, is a God who first and foremost loves us back and who wants to be with us. So what is worship? Point number one. You can write this down, it's on your outline. I would sum up worship in this way. Worship is, I love you and thank you. God, Jesus, Father, I love you and thank you. People who are grateful in any kind of relationship are people who recognize that they have been given something that maybe they don't deserve and something that shows them that they are valued by another. And worship is rightly understood an assembly of people who know they don't deserve God's love. They don't need to earn God's love. That they are called to be with God and to be with brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow believers. Because what we share in common may not be how much we make, may not be the jobs we've done, may not be the season in life that we're at right now, but what we all have in common is we are loved unconditionally by our Heavenly Father. And part of that love, part of that love is being able to be a part of a community, part of a family that we are accepted wherever we are, whatever we may be going through. 
and to be reminded again, despite all of the evidence that seems to the contrary in this culture, that there is a God, and He is at work, and He does love us. Look at Psalm 95 once again. This is, Psalm 95 is one of what are called in Christian worship theology, the Venite Psalms. Venite means, in Latin, is O come. Because the verses start, this is a, a call to worship. Now when the Bible says, O come, it is, of course, depending on the context in the text, either inviting people to a place of worship, but also an acknowledgement that God is, God is here. And I make that distinction because when we come to worship on Sunday morning, we don't ask God to be here. He's here. In fact, he's called us to be here. We'll talk more about that later on. But we don't have to make God come. He, he, he's here. But when God says, oh, come, let us, and let's just look at it. Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2 and forward. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. You see there that in those few verses, we see the heart of what we are to do when we do come to worship. Let's just define a few words here. The word worship in Hebrew, here in the, in the book of Psalms, there are various words for worship, but the primary word that's used for worship is their Hebrew word, saha. And it literally means to fall down on your face. It was the common practice of any ancient person who was in the presence of somebody of higher status, especially a king or someone prominent. You were not seen to be worthy to look at them because of who they were. And so you would literally fall down, bow down. By the time we get to the Greek language, worship, hasa, is, saha, excuse me, is translated proskuneo. And that again in Greek means literally to adore, to bow, and in some places it's even defined to kiss. And interestingly enough, as I was researching this word, proskuneo was also used to describe what a dog does to its owner when it licks its hand. If ever, any of you have dogs, you know that sometimes your dogs will come and they'll lick your hand because they belong to you. I know that's not politically correct. I still stay pet owners these days, right? Pet parents, but I'm not going to do that stupid stuff. So anyway, you, you know, you own the dogs and they love you because they know you're the master. And it's usually not out of fear, it's out of, again, reverence. But that aside, that's the idea. But here's what I also want you to see what Psalm, Book of Psalms tells us, among other places. That worship involves every part of us. When the Bible says bow down, that's both figurative and literal. There are times in our worship service where we bow down, we kneel. And the reason we retain kneeling in our worship services is to acknowledge that God is God and we're not. There are times that we bow, especially those who are attending the altar, altar assistants or pastors, we bow at the altar as an action of reverence. Now we're going to look at the flow of worship and what we do in worship next Sunday, and we're also going to talk about our sanctuary and the symbolism of this sanctuary, but just for today, just understand that the altar represents, again, God is everywhere, but it harkens back to the Old Testament period where the altar was the action of the sacrifices, the action of where God met his people. It was also seen as a table where God would feast and would dine with his people. And so bowing is, again, that, that recognition. You notice the emotion words here, with joy, with thanksgiving. We are to worship God with our emotions. It is okay to be happy. It is okay to be sad. It is okay to laugh, it's okay to cry. We come to a worship service, and I know you know this, because I know many of you, and there are times where you come in with great joy. And things are sometimes very humorous. We all like funny things. 
But there are also times where we come with heavy hearts and with confused hearts. And again, God wants us to come as we are, where we are, and bring our whole self to him. Worship is also about the mind. When it says in verse 2, make a joyful noise to him with songs, of, I'm sorry, verse 6, let us bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Again, not only is that a physical manifestation of our worship, but it's also something that we choose to do. It's a willing. In other words, we worship God with our minds. At this church, we want to be a church that thinks, that goes deep into God's word. That's not afraid to go deep into the words, to the languages. Because thinking and looking at words and looking at context and looking at history and backgrounds, all of those have to do with worshiping God with our minds. Or to the point, God, I love you and thank you. By the time we get to English, we see the word proskuneo is in Anglo-Saxon Old English, is defined as worth-ship. And that's where we get our English word worship from. It is ascribing worth and value to someone or something. In some cases, it was pronounced worth-shape to reflect that we become what we worship. We are shaped by what we worship. And think about that. Think about a person who maybe worships something and you know what they worship and it can be sports, it can be their job, it can be their, their health, their age, whatever it may be, where that is their ultimate value, their ultimate good, and are they not shaped by that? That's who they are. For many people today, their political preferences are their functional God which is why people fight so vehemently if they think something is being taken away from them as opposed to having a logical, civil conversation about disagreements. But all of this reflects, let me say it again, as I began with, a heart that was created to worship. Now in the worship service, we do certain things and we do them on purpose. And we do them because they are commanded by scripture. So for example, you see on your notes the elements of worship. The Bible tells us that we are to sing and make music in our church as we worship. And so we have choirs, we have organs, we have guitars, we have piano, we have bells. We seek to make a joyful noise to the Lord with the music that we employ. The Bible tells us that we are to pray together and to pray for one another, that there is to be reading of scripture, the teaching and preaching of God's word, the Lord's table, holy communion, and financial giving to support the ministry and mission of the church. Now there are some things that we do, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but just ba bear with me for a moment. There are certain things that we do that are not commanded by scripture, but they're not prohibited by scripture either. It's actually called the normative principle of worship. There are some churches that will only do what is commanded in Scripture, these things. And so they will allow nothing else. There are other churches, Lutheran Church being one of them, which believes we do what God commands, but we also are permitted to do what Scripture does not prohibit. For example, making announcements. For example, temple talks. Now you may not necessarily like them, you may think that we should have more of them and not less of them. But the scripture does not say at the beginning of ye service, make an announcement for the church to make sure they show up to the Wednesday dinner. It's not in there, but it doesn't hurt us either. So you get, you get the idea. So with all of this, what does worship provide? Worship provides this, and this is the final point this morning. Worship provides and gives us rest gives us rest and by that I mean I think physical rest for sure now I know for many of you Sunday is your only day that you don't have to get up but you do and I think God appreciates that but at the same time 
when you come to worship, and I know many of you have responsibilities, you serve here, whether it's altar guild or a choir or ushers or greeters, all of our, our volunteer positions, but overall what's meant to be here is for you to come and rest in God's love. You know, in Psalm 95, you might have read, as, as you heard the, the psalm read today, and think, all, you know, the psalm's talking about all this praise and all this bowing down and emotion and joy and thanksgiving, and then all of a sudden it begins to stop and say, don't harden your hearts as you did at Meribah. Kind of an odd thing in the middle of a psalm on praise. Well, there's a good reason why the psalmist King David is alluding to this event that happened in the history of Israel. In fact, you can read about it in Exodus 17. The people were wandering in the desert during the wilderness wanderings, the 40 years that they were in the desert. Most scholars believe that they could have made it to the promised land from Egypt to where they were going if they went in a straight line for roughly two, three weeks. But it took them 40 years. And the reason for that was they, were, they kept disobeying God. And so God commanded them, pack everything up in the morning, Start heading to where I tell you. I'll tell you when to stop. When you stop, you unload everything, set up the tabernacle first, and then stay there until I tell you, which will be the next morning. You get up and you do it all over again. But they came to a place called Meribah. And it had to do with the water that they wanted God to give. And they were mad at God because he wasn't quick enough. And so they hardened their hearts. And so God said, all right, you're not going to enter my rest today. And the ultimate rest was the promised land. But I want you to catch the symbol here because the same is true for us, friends. We carry, we carry a lot of baggage, so to speak. And there are things we carry that God says we can give to him. We can surrender it to him. But we continue to carry it. We continue to let it weigh us down. But when we worship, we come to be told once again and to remember once again and to sing the truth once again that God is on the throne. We're not, and we don't have to be. That we can actually rest in his love for us. We can actually give him and surrender the burdens that we have, chief of which are our sin, our guilt, our shame. This is one of the reasons why we have conf confession right up front in the worship service. So that we can unload to God so that our minds are clear enough to hear his word, his promises. Whether those promises are read in his word or sung in an anthem or corporately sung in a hymn. The idea is God wants to give us that rest. That's what we were created for. Jesus in our gospel lesson today knew that what Satan was offering him was really the heart of it was worship. Luke tells us that Jesus was taken and shown all the kingdoms of the world. Now, this is a whole other sermon, but the word there means literally, the Greek word is cosmos, which means those governments, systems, structures that have been literally handed over to Satan. And that's many aspects of this world today, this culture today. And Satan promises Jesus all of the power, all of the glory, all of the control that comes with the message of those earthly kingdoms. But Jesus knew it's all about worship. Because if you worship anything else other than the true God, again, you are going to be in bondage. You're going to be weighed down. So Jesus tells Satan, it is written, you shall worship God. And him only shall you serve. Friends in Christ, today in this Lenten season, we start with worship because, again, that's who we are. That's where God meets us. In the Lutheran church, we call this a worship service. Not primarily because we are here to serve God, but because God serves us. The quote from a Lutheran theologian is at the bottom of your notes. I would encourage you to read it. But we believe that the scripture teaches us that in this collective gathering, God 
comes to us to serve us through his word, through his sacraments. And the word can involve, again, not only the reading and preaching and teaching of God's word, but I'll say it again, it can also include the singing of God's word. Whether we sing it or our choir sings it or our cantor sings it, we are singing the truths of God, God's promises. So again, my prayer for you is that this journey of Lent for you, that you walk with God, that you in your life surrender to God. Let me remind you that we have people here after worship that will be able to pray with you if you'd like. If you're just starting out trying to figure out or wonder where it is that God is, is working in your life or you want a new beginning or a new direction, stop by and get prayer. It's confidential. No one will necessarily counsel you or anything like that, but they will pray for you. They will offer to you not only the gift of prayer, but the gift of connection. Because we do care about you. We care about your life and your spiritual life. So would you please bow your heads with me? And I want us to close in prayer here. And I want us to think about that we are here because God has called us together. The Holy Spirit has gathered us. You may feel like it was just kind of off the top of your head you decided to come this morning. Maybe you're feeling guilty that you hadn't been in a while. Maybe there's something going on, a challenge in your life, and you just needed to be somewhere that was positive, that was hopeful. But Lord, friends, we are bold to say that whatever the reason is, it's God's reason. Because he created you to love him, to bow down and serve him. Because when we do, we are doing what we were created to do. We are acknowledging that we don't need to carry the world on our shoulders and that we can rest in his arms. So Father, thank you for helping us. And now when we come to your table, we come with our whole being, our body, our minds, our spirit, our souls. And then we take in the wine and the bread as we sing, as we bow our heads, be real to us. Make all that we've talked about this morning real to our hearts so that we can really worship you in spirit and in truth.